Welcome back everyone, Patrick here. And in this next video, what we're gonna do is another question dealing with quadrilateral. So what we're gonna do is provide the coordinates of any quadrilateral. So I'm just gonna do this on the fly, pick a bunch of random coordinates. You don't necessarily even have to use the coordinates that I'm gonna use. You could pick your own coordinates as well. And then what we're gonna do is in part A, we're gonna find the midpoint of each side of that quadrilateral. And then we're gonna show in part B that the lines joining the midpoints form a parallelogram. So we went over this property in a previous video where we generally described it that if you draw any quadrilateral, so any random quadrilateral, let's say maybe something like that, and then you find the midpoints of each side and then you join the midpoints, a parallelogram is always going to be formed, meaning that this side and this side are going to be parallel and then this side and then this side are going to be parallel right so we're going to verify this property now with actual numbers and it's just going to be random numbers that we pick so let's first start off with just a random diagram of a quadrilateral so let me just draw one now the points I'm going to pick, it's not necessarily the quadrilateral on like a Cartesian plane is not necessarily going to look like this. Okay, I'm just drawing this diagram for reference. So let's pick a point over here. Let's say, I don't know, negative four, negative one. Maybe over here we could pick like five and negative eight. And then over here, let's pick, uh, I don't know, eight and ten. And then down here, let's maybe pick, let's see a combination of positives and negatives. So maybe we could have like a negative value. So let's say negative seven, and then we'll do a positive value. So let's say six, like that, right? Just random coordinates I picked. Again, this is not to scale. If you actually plot these coordinates, this quadrilateral is probably going to look a lot different on a Cartesian plane, the shape of it. But I'm um, just, again, using this diagram as reference so we can keep track of what we're doing. I actually forgot to label these. So this is A, B, C, and then D, like that. So what we're first going to do in part A is find the midpoint of each side here. So let's first find the midpoint of A, B. Now, what is the midpoint formula? We add the X values divided by 2, and then we add the Y values divided by two. So we're going to be finding this point over here. So let's label this x1, y1. We'll label this as x2, y2. So we would end up with um, x1, which is negative four, plus five. That's going to be divided by two. And then we'll have y1, which is negative one, plus negative eight. That's going to be divided by two. So we'd end up with over here, negative four plus five is one. So that's going to be one over two negative one plus negative eight is like negative one minus eight, right? The positive and the negative, those turn into a negative. Negative one minus eight is negative nine. So we'd end up with negative nine over two over here. And then these don't simplify and I'm gonna leave them in fractions. You can work with the decimals if you want, but just in case your teacher wants you to work with fractions, fractions are tougher to work with than decimals. So I'm gonna leave it in fractions. So we'll have 1 over 2, negative 9 over 2. That's the midpoint of this side, AB. Now what's the midpoint of BC going to be? Well, we already have x2, y2 over here, so let's label this as x1, y1. So what would change here is this coordinate and then this coordinate, right? So we have the x1, which would be 8, and then we have the y1, which would be 10 like that. So this would end up being 13 over 2. And then we'll have 10 plus negative 8, which is like 10 minus 8, which is 2 over 2 would give us 1. So this midpoint over here would be um, 13 over 2. Give me a sec here. Yes, 13 over 2 and, uh, and 1. You know what? I'm going to just erase this B value here this B coordinate because we're not even going to be using it after this. So we'll have 13 over 2 
and one like that for that midpoint. Now let's find the midpoint over here of C D. So notice the C is already labeled as X1, Y1. So let's label the D coordinate as X2, Y2. So what would change is the X2 over here and then the Y2. So we'd end up with uh, X1 plus X2, which is negative seven over here. Be careful with the brackets. Then we'll have 10 plus six like that. So we would have eight plus negative seven is like eight minus seven. And then we'll have 16. And so we'd end up with one over two and then eight like that. So this over here is one over two and eight. And now at this point, all that's remaining is to find the midpoint of this side of AD. And notice we have it already labeled x2, y2, x1, y1. So x1 plus x2, so it'd be negative four plus negative seven. That's gonna be divided by two. Then we'll have y1, which is negative one, plus uh, y2, which is six. And then that's gonna be divided by two. So negative four plus negative seven is like negative four minus seven. And then negative one plus six would give us positive five. This doesn't simplify. Negative four minus seven gives us negative 11 over two. And then five over two, right? These don't simplify over here. So this midpoint over here is gonna be negative 11 over two and five over two like that. All right, so we completed part A. We found all of the midpoints of this quadrilateral, of this random quadrilateral that we provided coordinates for. Again, you don't have to necessarily use these coordinates, but uh, you could pick any coordinates and then this property you'll notice is always gonna hold. So now what we gotta do in part B is we gotta verify that the quadrilateral that's formed when we join the midpoints so joining this, joining this, what we have to confirm or verify is that this quadrilateral here is a parallelogram. And then how do we confirm or verify a parallelogram? Well, all we have to do is show that the opposite sides are parallel. So really we just have to find the slope of this, 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 and this, right? And show that we have a pair of parallel sides. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna erase these coordinates here, just so there's not too much going on in the diagram. And then let's just label these. So I'm gonna label this as E, I'll label this as F, we'll have G over here, and then we'll have H over here, just to have some kind of reference when we're gonna be finding these slopes. So let's first find the slope of this side over here. So let's find the slope of EF. And remember the slope formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? Rise over run, so let's label these x1, y1. Label this as x2, y2. So we're gonna have y2, which is one, minus y1, which is negative nine over two. So just be careful with the brackets here. x2, which is 13 over two, minus x1, which is one over two like that. Let's work with this on the side. So one minus negative nine over two, that's like one plus nine over two, which would be like two over two plus nine over two, right? If we change this one to have a common denominator and then that would be 11 over two. So notice that this numerator here is 11 over two and then 13 over two minus one over two, that would give us what? 12 over two, which would just give us six. So we're gonna be dividing by six over here. Now, whenever I have a fraction like this dividing by a number, I like to take that number, change it to b over one. So it's like a fraction divided by another fraction. So what we could do is we could rewrite this as 11 over two divided by six over one like that, which would be like 11 over two times one over six, which would give us 11 over 12. Right, so that ends up being the slope of EF. So let's keep track of this over here. So this would be 11 over 12, like that. Okay, so that's the slope of EF. Now let's find the slope 
of fg over here. So we have x2, y2. I'm going to label this as x1, y1. So we'd have y2, which is 1, minus y1, which is 8, over x2, which is 13 over 2, minus x1, which is just 1 over 2. So notice it's actually the same as that x1. So we know that that denominator is just going to end up being 6. And then notice that 1 minus 8, that gives us negative 7. So we'd end up with negative 7 over 6. Can't simplify that any further. right? Oh, sorry, I forgot to say we're finding the slope of fg there. right? So that ends up being the slope of fg. It's going to be negative 7 over 6 like that. Now let's find the slope of gh over here. So we already have g labeled x1, y1. Let's label h as x2, y2. And what are we hoping to get, right? gh should have the same slope as ef. So the work we're about to do, finding the slope of gh, the slope should equal 11 over 12. So let's see if it indeed does. So we'd end up with 5 over 2, y2 minus y1 over uh, x2 minus x1, like that. OK, so let's work with the 5 over 2 minus 8. That 8 is like over 1. If we want to get a common denominator, multiply by 2. So we'd have 5 over 2 minus 16 over 2, which would give us negative 11 over 2. So this numerator simplifies to negative 11 over 2. And then we'll have negative 11 over 2 minus 1 over 2. Notice we already have a common denominator there. That would be negative 12 over 2, which would give us negative 6. So we'd have negative 6 over here. So let's put that, it's like over 1. So we could rewrite this as negative 11 over 2 divided by negative 6 over 1, which would be like negative 11 over 2 times 1 over negative 6. Notice negative times negative is just a positive. 11 times 1 is 11. 2 times 6 is 12. So we indeed got that same slope of 11 over 12. So that's a good sign. And we got one more to go. We got to find the slope of EH, right? Of that side right there. So we already have the uh, x2, y2, x1, y1 labeled. Again, you could label this as x2, y2, this as x1, y1. I'm just going to keep it like this since we already labeled it from the previous work. So we'll have uh, y2, which is 5 over 2, minus y1, which is negative 9 over 2, over x2, which is negative 11 over 2, minus x1, which is 1 over 2 like that. And hopefully, this slope that we're going to solve for, for EH, is going to be the same slope as FG. Hopefully, we get negative 7 over 6. But let's confirm that we do. So let's work with this numerator on the side. So negative, negative turned into a positive. That would be, what, 14 over 2, right? Which would give us just 7. So this numerator, it actually simplifies to just 7. Then negative 11 over 2 minus 1 over 2, we did that in the work before. That ends up being negative 12 over 2, which gives us just uh, negative 6. And so we can bring that negative up. Notice we do indeed get that same slope. All right, so we confirmed the property. And that's it. So no matter what quadrilateral you choose, so notice this, this, Right, both of these, uh, yeah, both of these are parallel, and then EF and GH, both of these are parallel. They have the same slope, so that confirms that we're dealing with a parallelogram. Right, so it's a pretty cool property. You could pick literally any coordinates for that quadrilateral initially. Um, they could be whole numbers, as we did. You could even pick fractions if you want to work with fractions from the beginning. 
And then no matter what you pick, no matter if you put it in decimals, no matter what numbers you pick, you pick, you find the midpoints, those mid midpoints are always going to form a parallelogram.